Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash petty revenge, where the revenges don't destroy lives, but they're still oh so satisfying. And in today's episode, OP's neighbors repeatedly park on his front lawn, and he decides to get petty to teach them a lesson that they won't forget. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's lineup. Hit subscribe if you haven't, and as always, you can send or link stories to this email right here. Let's dive in. So this happened when I was around 10 or 12 years old. Our next door neighbor was a nosy, lazy, stay-at-home mom. She liked to complain about almost everything. My sister, who was around 17, had friends ranging from the same age to a few years older, and they would often come to the house most of every weekend. Sometimes it would be a couple of friends and others up to 15 or so. The neighbor surprisingly never complained about a bunch of teenagers being at our house every weekend, until she decided to, I guess. They never made a lot of noise, as my dad worked weekends, so the number one rule was do not keep dad awake, or wake him up. This was during school holidays in the summer, so my dad had the following day off. My sister had three friends over that night, and all they did was watch a movie. The movie wasn't loud, dad couldn't hear it from the veranda where he was sitting, and they didn't even stay late. They went home at about 9.30, but just after 10pm, two cops show up to the doorstep. They said they're responding to a noise complaint from our next door neighbor about a wild party. Now, the cops were obviously confused, as they were greeted by a grumpy late 30s guy in a dressing gown with a book in one hand, smoke in the other, a cup of tea on the table in front of him, just chilling on his veranda, instead of the rager they'd been told about. That's when dad said, look, I hate the kids coming here, but tonight, three kids were here watching a movie. They left over half an hour ago. I don't know what the F she's on about. My dad was pissed. Now, he didn't enjoy our house being the designated hangout place, but as mom always said, at least we know where our daughter is. But even that night, he wasn't annoyed because it was a small group watching a movie. Don't call the cops because they're watching a movie. So my dad got petty. Our neighbor would always have afternoon naps at 1 o'clock. Her bedroom was about 5 meters from our driveway, so she was pretty close. Our front yard was also huge. Our house was pretty small, and it sat on over a quarter acre. Two-thirds of that quarter acre was our front yard. Well, the next day, the lawn needed mowing. It being summer, dad would normally mow as early as possible in the most efficient way possible. It would normally take him 40 minutes, but not that day. My dad waited until 12.45, and then he started the mower. And my dad did it in the most convoluted way possible. Two straight hours of mowing. Then, being the responsible camper he is, he decided that it was time to count the 10 pegs. They're kept in a metal army box. There's about 300 pegs in there because why not, apparently. So out to the driveway, right next to our bedroom window, one peg at a time, my dad took it out, stood up, and threw it full force at the driveway. All you could hear was bang, clang, clash. You get the picture. Then one at a time, he picked them up off the driveway. My dad stood up, threw them full force back into the metal box, bang, clang, clash. The woman came out to scowl at him a couple of times, but he didn't say a word. My dad was extra cranky that night, due to the probable heat stroke, but he always had such glee when recounting that story. Guys, I love the fact that the dad doesn't like the kids hanging out there, but he still pulled a stunt like that to spite the neighbor. Hey, don't you dare mess with the kids that I hate. Like, what a badass dad, right? So, for some context, this happened years and years ago, while my family was still living in Germany. My dad had just lost his job, which prompted us to look for less expensive housing options, and we moved from our relatively nice, older apartment building to one of those prefabricated concrete ones in a different district. I was 9 years old at the time, so I didn't care too much about the aesthetics of the building. I was just thrilled at the fact that we now had direct access to a courtyard and cement pathways that I could ride my bike on. While my parents were still unpacking, some of the kids from down the hall came to our door and asked if I wanted to ride bikes with them, which became our weekend routine for a while. It only stopped when an old lady from the same side of the hall made a complaint about us being in the courtyard. Not that we were being loud or vulgar, just that we were there. Now mind you, all the apartments on our side of the hall faced the road, which was completely opposite to the courtyard we used, so she couldn't even see us when we were outside. She sold it to my parents as I'm looking out for the other tenants, and claimed that people had complained to her specifically about how they were worried about walking into the courtyard while there were a couple of kids on bikes in the general area. My parents pretty much ignored her, and they just told me to play with my friends on one of the nearby streets. But none of us wanted to do that since we couldn't practice bike tricks on the road. 
About a week after I ignored her complaint, I had stayed out past the time I was meant to be home, and I left my bike around the side of the building, so I could get it the next morning. However, as you might have guessed at this point, I woke up the next day to find my bike missing. Now I, being a dramatic little kid, ran up the stairs to our hall sobbing, and told my parents what had happened. Apparently the old lady told my parents that she had taken the bike from outside, inside, because we were still in the courtyard, and she was mad at me for not going onto the street like they had asked. My parents then told me to go down the hall and politely ask for my bike back, which I did. Unfortunately, the old lady told me that I needed to be taught a lesson, and I have to give her a written apology. And yes, the woman wanted a written apology. She then said that I could have it back at the end of the week, and it was only Sunday. I was of course pissed. I knew she wasn't allowed to steal something that was mine, so I took a few days to plot my all-time brilliant revenge. So next Saturday rolls around, and I was pretty much ready to put my plan into motion. I had put on a pretty good show of being remorseful to my mom, who lent me some money to buy a tin full of biscuits to apologize with. I had my written apology, the biscuits, and several vablas in a sandwich bag that I had hidden in my coat. Now, for those of you who have never heard of vabla, it's a salted dried fish that's popular in Russia, and I personally think it's one of the worst smells maybe ever. My mom's Russian and she loves them, which is why we had so many in the apartment. I then knocked on the lady's door and she invited me in to put the things down. She then accepted my letter and the biscuits, and I asked her if I could use the bathroom before I left with my bike, which she allowed. So while she was sitting in the living room, I quickly hustled quietly around her bathroom and bedroom, hiding one of those gross dried fish anywhere I thought that she wouldn't look. I stuck them between the pipes under the sink, stuffed them under her giant wardrobe, and even thrown some on top of one of her giant floor-to-ceiling dressers. With all the natural stink bombs deployed, I then washed my hands and all but sprinted out of her apartment with my bike, thrilled with the stunt that I'd managed to pull off. Now, from what I overheard from discussions between the parents of my friends and I, the old lady complained to the landlord about the awful fish smell on several occasions, before she finally decided to hire a company to come deep clean her apartment. The woman found and complained about the very old, very nasty fish, and she actually moved out a couple of months later. Of course, now being a full-grown adult, I do feel bad about it now, but at the time, I felt like the biggest, coolest genius known to man. So I guess the moral of the story is to not confiscate bikes from a vindictive kid, and don't ever try Fabla. Seriously. Honestly guys, I personally think OP has nothing to feel bad about. Like the woman literally thought that confiscating a bike from a 9 year old and holding it hostage for a week was okay. All because she didn't like them playing outside in the courtyard. Like if I was the parents, I'd lose my mind and I definitely would have gotten police involved. But hey, stinking up a house bad enough for her to pay money out of her own pocket to get it cleaned and then moving away a few months later, I'd consider the Vabla a better option. So I used to live in a very small house, on a small block with very narrow front lawns, with neighbors very close by. The family over the road had two parents and five boys, from about 18 down to 7. They were loud, obnoxious, and their way was right. They were always doing burnouts and revving their stupid four-cylinder cars with straight pipes. They also had a dozen cats that would be out all night, pissing on everything, and also killing birds and other wildlife. I turned the hose on two cats I saw in my garden. The mom saw it, and she wasn't the least bit happy. I just waved at her. They would also occasionally send the youngest over to try to talk to me about Jesus, and he would tell me that I'm going to hell for my sins. Anyway, mom had a car, dad had a car, the two eldest had a car each, and there was also a project car. There was nowhere near enough space for all these cars, so they would often park one or two up the road at the park and walk down. One day, I came home to the one son who decided to park on my front lawn, right on the grass. Now I'm thinking, no big deal, I'm pretty accommodating. A few days later, it was still there. So I saw the dad and said that I needed that car moved. They moved the car, and I mowed my lawn, and it was a very nice lawn. It was green, thick, and healthy. One of the better ones on my street. That afternoon, the car was back on my freshly mowed lawn. I thought to myself, this isn't going to resolve itself. I saw them again the next day and said they can't keep parking on my lawn, that they have their own space or to keep parking up the street. The guy then tells me, you've only got one car, we have five cars, we need the space. Again I find that the car was parked back on my lawn again. So I saw the dad and said that he needs to move the car as I'm doing some gardening and don't want to damage it, and don't want it in my way. 
The dad says, it'll be alright, just work around it. So that's when I decided to get some petty revenge. That's when I got out bags of blood and bone and threw out heaps of it, onto the grass. It stank. I threw it in the gardens, on the lawns, some got on the car, whatever. The dad said it would be fine, and it stunk. Now, being a petty individual at times, I then got a bottle of fart spray called Liquid Ass out of the house. I then opened the lid and poured it along the base of the windscreen and where the aircon intake is. Then a little more, and then a little more. I had a good chuckle, and then put the sprinklers on and went inside. About 30 minutes later, the son gets in his car, and I hear him go, Oh my god, what the F? Followed by his door slamming, and he drove off. The son never said anything to me, but the dad was pretty upset. He told me how much the car stank from whatever I did to my garden, and the son was pissed because some girl he liked wouldn't get in the car with him. I said it's okay, it'll be alright, and they stopped parking there after that. Guys, I love that the cherry on top was that the girl refused to get into the guy's car. Serves him right though, like who in the frickin' world decides to park on someone's front lawn on the grass? And for all of you who are wondering why OP had bags of bone and blood, relax, don't call the police, because OP pops into the comments and explains that bone meal and blood meal work great as a slow-release fertilizer. That's the first that I've heard. Alright, so I'm a 35-year-old male, and I have a younger brother who's named Todd, 29 years old, who had a complicated birth and had to stay a month in the ICU. Because of that, my parents have always doted on him, and almost denied him nothing. Even if it was to the detriment of my sister Abby and I. My brother drinks in on the attention, and on more than one occasion, he's made himself the center of attention at my, my sister, or cousin's special event. Because of this, Abby and I have a strained relationship with Todd and our parents. Unfortunately, Todd met and fell in love with this girl named Lucy, who announced her own pregnancy at the baby shower that my mom held for Abby. When I proposed to my wife Michelle, I just wanted to elope, but she really wanted her family to be there, so I invited my family out of obligation. When my best man Jim noticed a receipt from a jewelry store slip out of Todd's pocket, Jim confronted Todd about this, which led to an argument. Jim then told me everything, and I told Todd that he was no longer going to be a groomsman because I know he was going to propose at my wedding. Todd then cried to our parents, which led to a blowout. In my parents' eyes, since Todd had never admitted that he was going to propose to Lucy at my wedding, that I was unfairly judging him. I refused and brought up Todd's past behavior. My parents couldn't refute this and got Todd to agree to not try anything at my wedding. And he did. Now, this wasn't enough to convince me to let him be groomsman, but I warned him that if as a guest, if he'd try anything, I would make him regret it. So fast forward to the wedding and surprise, surprise. Todd walks over to Lucy and proposed to her during Michelle's father-daughter dance. And he did it in a way so everyone would notice. So cue my revenge. Jim and I then hired a woman to pretend to be Todd's side piece who cornered Todd and Lucy and claimed that she was pregnant with his baby. Of course, Todd denied this, but when she called his phone, it didn't look good. I did give her his number and mess with Todd's phone to incriminate him. Lucy then throws the ring back at Todd and left in tears. When Todd saw the smile on my face, he knew it was me, and I didn't respond to a single call or text from him or my parents until after the honeymoon. Lucy's thrown all of Todd's stuff out, and she's been denying access to their kid. Todd is furious, and he's demanding that I clear his name. I sent him a text saying that I had no idea what he was talking about, as well as a screenshot of a bill for the wedding, and gave a vague message demanding reimbursement for half the wedding costs. Michelle knew the whole time what I was planning, and she gave me the green light after Todd ruined the moment with her dad. So I felt pretty good, but now even Abby thinks I went too far. Guys, one thing I've learned from reading all these Reddit stories is you should never, ever, ever propose at someone's wedding without permission from the bride and groom. And guys, I am totally shocked that Todd decided that the best time to propose was during the father and daughter dance. Like, holy crap, the audacity. Now, I don't want to say that Todd deserved what happened to him, but hey, he was told multiple times not to pull that stunt, and Todd himself agreed not to pull that stunt, so what else did he think was going to happen? Sometimes, you have to teach entitled family members a lesson that they won't forget. So today, I did something out of nothing but pettiness, but I feel I've done the right thing in the long run. Now don't get me wrong, this was done purely for my own satisfaction, but reflecting on it, I feel I'd want to know this sort of thing if I was in the guest girlfriend's shoes. 
I recently started a new job as a housekeeper at a popular chain hotel. And while I'm enjoying the vomit rooms from stags, parties, etc., it really does irritate me. They always somehow manage to get it on the carpet area of the room, and it puts me behind schedule having to scrub at the carpet. This one room today really took it to the next level. There was rubbish scattered about, food jammed down the sides of the bed, as well as vomit patches all over the room. It took a while to get through all the mess, but towards the end of the cleaning, I found a birthday card addressed to the guest on the floor. The card was open and read, Happy birthday, guest. I love you so much. Have a great birthday weekend away. I'm gonna miss you so much. Love, Beth. I picked up the card to bin it, but when I closed it, the front read, To my amazing boyfriend on his birthday, and my eyebrows immediately raised. I had just picked up multiple condom wrappers, seen the used ones in the bins, as well as finding a pair of used woman's underwear and a torn dress in the sheets. I was originally going to throw the dress and underwear away, as they were both clearly torn beyond wear. And the guest had most likely intended for me to do that, but damn, I was so mad about the vomit and the crusty food. The poor girl has been cheated on by a man who trashed the hotel room, but luckily for her, he pissed me off. I then took the torn dress and underwear down to reception and logged it into our lost and found with the room number attached. Our system always sends a copy of lost item emails to the emergency contact as well, just in case the guest misses the email. The cheater and his emergency contact will soon receive a friendly email with a photograph of the forgotten items and a description of what they are and where they were found in the room. And who's his emergency contact? His girlfriend, Beth. If you're gonna cheat on your significant other, don't piss off the housekeeper. Guys, I absolutely love how petty this is. Also, who the heck does this to hotel rooms? Like food stuffed between the walls, vomit all over the carpets, I mean, a weekend getaway to have an affair is one thing, but damn, do you really have to turn into complete trashy wild animals? So here's a little setup. My dad is one of nine children to my grandparents. When the oldest sister, my aunt, who, let's call her Margaret, got married, one of the gifts she received was four very poorly made clay pots from one of her friends who wasn't super close to the family. The pots were all very different to each other and they didn't match at all. I assume they came out of a first-time pottery class or something. Anyway, fast forward 15 years and my parents are getting married. Margaret shows up at the wedding, as does everyone else. The ceremony and reception pass with no drama, and everyone goes home. The following week, my parents begin to sort through their wedding gifts. They unwrap Margaret's to find a very worn-looking cardboard box, with old tape underneath and new tape put on top by Margaret to hold the lid closed. Dad opens the box to see the four pots that had been given to Margaret 15 years prior. Now my parents knew this was a gift to her originally because at the bottom of the box was a cord of congratulations on your wedding, addressed to Margaret. She hadn't even bothered to take the pots out of the box when she was gifted them or check the condition when rewrapping them. This thoroughly pissed off my dad. Then his anger turns into determination as he starts to develop a plan that would stretch almost a decade With Christmas fast approaching, my dad rewraps the pots in the same box with the same wedding card addressed to Margaret, essentially in the same condition he had received it in. He then wrote another card addressed to another one of his siblings, explaining his plan. He then gave the present to the youngest of his siblings. The newer card explained that she was to hold onto the pots until next Christmas, making sure to unwrap it and making sure that everyone could see the pots in one way or another. The card then explained to leave the wedding card in the box and not to let anyone see it. My auntie would then hold onto the box, pots, and card until next Christmas. She would then gift them and my dad's note to the next sibling, above her age, who's my uncle. The cycle would repeat another eight times until it reached the oldest sibling, Margaret. In my dad's letter, it instructed the last sibling before Margaret to not give her the letter written by him regarding the plan. So nine years after giving the gift away, my dad and all his siblings watched as she pulls out the pots that she had seen being passed around from sister to brother to sister for the last decade. She then noticed the note still in the box. She opened it and a category 4.2 earthquake was registered as her jaw hits the floor. Now, most people would expect her to erupt in rage, but Australians have some of the best senses of humor on the planet. The family all had a good chuckle about it and they moved on to Christmas lunch. The pots are now all separated, one going to my dad, one going to Margaret, my grandparents, and the last one being the trophy of the annual cricket game. 
it was sadly destroyed by a rogue ball in that very same yearly tournament, and is now only half a trophy. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash petty revenge. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's wonderful stories. If you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these awesome stories. And if you missed the last episode on the channel, I'll link it right here. It's an r slash entitled people. Where OP buys the last PlayStation 5 and a Karen goes completely psycho and tries to get him jailed over it. It's such a funny story, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.